So, um, Max Andrews and Mariana Coppola. Voilà. Um, so thank you for the Athens Biennial for inviting us, and um, of course it's great to be here today. I'm going to go straight into the job, um, so to speak. Um, we're an independent curatorial office, and we've been working together since 2005. And we were asked to talk about this um, project, the, it's a bit of a mouthful, the new Future Art Wells Curatorial Disruption Foresight Group. I'm going to get to that in a bit. Um, but I would like to um, explain a little bit what, where it came from and what this is. Um, the New Future Curatorial, sorry, the New Future Outworlds Curatorial Disruption Foresight Group is a forum for mega trends and uh, of future institutions of contemporary art. So the way it has worked, it has been a, an itinerary think tank, so to speak, that has no affiliation. There has been three um, meetings so far. Uh, the first one started in May in Bari in the context of an international curatorial retreat in the south of Italy in collaboration with Vessel and um, MADA, the Monash uh, Art and Design Architecture um, University in, in Australia and Melbourne. And the second meeting was in, in Care Star Foundation in San Francisco as part of a residency that we did there this last summer. And the third meeting and last happened last Sunday in, um, in Birmingham in the UK in the context of the Associate Scheme Program of the uh, Eastside Projects space. Um, so to explain a little bit more about the origins of this, uh, just quickly to mention that in 2012-2013 we did this uh, research project called Open Curating, which um, de was developed through a course of a year and a half around uh, it w what we departed from was an analogy from looking into open journalism, hence the name Open Curating, and the principles that were developed at that time by the Guardian newspaper. Um, there's no time to explain what these principles are, but um, the interviews were, um, these 10 interviews were published online and they're accessible, they're free to, to download and stuff and read, with curators, with artists, with uh, departments of web museums that were working at that time redefining their, their websites and how they communicated. Um, broadly speaking, the interviews were discussed, where we discussed with these people uh, were about the effects of the open network culture and how that affected exhibition making and exhibition practice and curatorial practice and artistic practice. Um, more or less departing from that um, point of view where we were breaking the schema of the exhibition plus catalog, um, that is the traditional way of thinking about exhibitions. And of course, the increasing the amount of participation which has been brought up by several people today. Um, and this, so the, the open journalism, the, the kind of uh, the trends of websites to be redefined at that time led us to um, thinking about institutions and infrastructure and of course governance, maybe perhaps because we don't have an institution, our institution is us. Um, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, I'm just trying to skip a few things. Um, so again, we were asking things about uh, should exhibitions resist this idea of becoming smarter, as in smartphones, or should be um, art be slow, or is it too slow, or do we want it to be slower, or do museums want to be faster, etc. The idea of pace and rhythms is, is coming in a bit. Um, so we were looking at this um, in order to escape the presentism as an attempt to imagine or invent future scenarios and prototyping institutions. Um, the, the format that we've been using for this uh, series of, of, of um, seminars, that's the title, um, came from a closed format. So we've been using a closed door invitation only meeting of experts somehow, or people that we wanted to involve in these meetings. There has been no recording format. The, we followed the Chatham House rule. I'm sure some of you are familiar with it. The idea is that you, um, you, um, these people that are in the room uh, are free to use the, and describe the contents that are happening in the discussion, but nothing should be done to identify or either explicitly or implicitly who said that. So the idea is that people are free to um, discuss things. They feel comfortable enough to, um, to know that the, what they say there is not going to be used uh, quoting them somehow. Um, so in Bari, this is a photo of a previous um, workshop, there were several ones, and this is in, we discussed uh, the, around the notion of the anti-conventional object, um, and what falls outside of the tradition of the sweet pot, the buildable, the desirable, or the profitable, 
And, um, but of course we were asking this about how we can repurpose all of this in, for art, in art institutions. And we also discussed the emerging usership concepts uh, that might shadow things like uh, the expert culture, the spectatorship, ownership, and, and authorship. Um, in San Francisco, of course, is, um, here we started not recording anything, so of course you only see the, the photo of the, of the door. <laughs> the, um, the participants included people that are currently running art centers and working in museum education, and artists and publishers, and people running curatorial programs as well. Um, so it focused more directly from, uh, from the point of view of institutions and how um, topics like the perceptions of collaboration between uh, institutions and technology, particularly in the context of Silicon Valley, we thought that was going to be a really ripe context for collaboration, but apparently um, not very successful examples were brought to the table. Um, also, there was a quite a lot of obsession because of that context, particularly Silicon Valley, the notion of screens in the museums, how obsessed museums are right now to bring that extra level of screens as if we didn't have enough outside of the museum doors and the whole idea of metrics and misrecognition and withdrawal and etc. So, um, and also what would be the ideal context for it, the ideal San Francisco art center to exist. The last one in, um, in ISAI project in Birmingham uh, focused in a more dramatic context. We gave the participants a sort of post-apocalyptic scenario where they, shot, they had to imagine that the art ecology of the city was completely devastated, so we have to regrow everything from scratch. And what would that be? It was an exercise for a whole day to, to be done in several uh, parts. Um, so we were, hand, we were thinking about what were the most important tools to um, be um, brought up and from the point of view of studio facilities to uh, art schools, etc. So throughout all of this, we've, we've been working with some of the um, ideas that Pascal Gielan, um, the way he characterizes horizontality and verticality in terms of um, instituting on institutions. Um, he speaks in terms of the erosion of values of traditionally vertical institutions and the drawbacks of living in a so-called flat art world. So in this case, horizontality is, is synonymous more or less with internet culture more information, more communication, more mobility, more flexibility, where anyone's opinion is equally valid, a kind of equivalent to a neoliberalism of, of competing markets, a world of homogeneity and flatness, more transparency, more openness, more participation, more algorithms, perhaps. On the other hand, um, vertical, the vertical, the verticality of, of tradition, of canons, of stability, values and ideals, where there's historical depth and authoritative height, also related to the kind of futurity of the avant-garde, we might say. Um, and his argument is that the modern institutions are now under increasing pressure, or have been for the last century, to give up any kind of verticality. So we ask ourselves in these workshops, what could be a new form of verticality or a new form of horizontality? Um, at the same time, we've been trying to fuse um, a very much a work in progress or fork from um, the notion of pace layering this is a diagram which first appeared in um, a book called The Clock of the Long Now in 99 by Stuart Brand, who was um, the founder of the Whole Earth Catalog, um, which deals with the notion of fast and slow components in a system, um, the notion that layers have different lifespans. So an institution might not itself exist, but it might be to do with uh, the different speeds of longevity. So it's not hard to see that um, this closely resembles rock strata, and this led to us to increasingly to think about geology, so that geology might perhaps be a more useful term than, than nature, and a much more powerful and dynamic term for thinking both ecologically and politically. So a geological underpinning of culture, which might sensitize us to, um, for example, the legacy of extractive moder modernism, which was referred to earlier, petrocapitalism. Um, here, fast fashion is like a kind of lo loose topsoil without structure, and information moves even faster. So perhaps in digging deeper, both literally and uh, figurative, figuratively, we might find a, a new model for institutions. So of course, geology is not a model of stability that we might think of, as, uh, think of it as. Geology evidences a volatile in human history of the Earth with volcanoes and upheavals in deep time. So how to think about artworks and institutions in terms of tens of thousands of years is, is a challenge. Thinking literally in depth, 
where the frame of reference is not just art history, but evolution, speciation, climate change, emergence of civilization, the origin of consciousness, which suggests a kind of move from think local, act global, to think historically, act geologically. Also proposes geology as a form of political critique in a way, uh, as an alternative to somewhat normative forms of activ activism. So this leads to a whole kind of series of an, um, possible imaginative proposals such as a literal and metaphorical underground, the corruption of the Watergate scandal perhaps needed to be underground literally in a parking garage in order to emerge. Uh, what this means for our, our kind of post-Snowden world is perhaps debatable. Um, so what also has emerged is, is a stress on institutions as imaginary or fictional structures. And we have also here Robert Smithson's Museum of the Void from 1966, which perhaps could be now imagined as a refuge rather than a tomb. Or, for example, this is um, the Museum of Lost Volumes, a, a project by architecture professor Neyran Turan, which she describes as a geo-architectural fiction and a satire commentary on resource extraction, a museum built after the depletion of rare earth minerals after their abundant use with green technologies. So it's, it speculates on the preservation of, of the geographic ruins that belong to the era of resource extraction. Um, so the final slide, so, or what, to, to go back in time, we could speculate, what did a colossal, a colossal displaced granite boulder near Berlin, um, what did that do to the imagination of Goethe in, the, in the, Goethe in the 1780s in the format of literary prose? a kind of sci-fi geology at that time, which led to theories of the Ice Age, of deep time and, and climatic change. So to finish, as historian Dipesh Chakrabarti has argued, planetary, the planetary crisis of climate change profoundly shakes up disciplines. So when, when thinking about new institutions or new verticality, what is required is, and to quote uh, Chakrabarti, to bring together intellectual formations that are somewhat in tension with each other, the planetary and the global, deep and recorded history, species thinking and critiques of capital. Thank you.